afternoon. Thanks for joining us on this full hour of the world today. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Here's what's coming up on the program. Ukrainian forces ordered to withdraw from the eastern city of Severodonetsk under bombardment for weeks. The Ukraine's Ukraine candidate status in historic moment. Plus, Prince Charles expresses sorrow over slavery in the Commonwealth 2022. A warm welcome again. Ukrainian troops have begun withdrawing from the outskirts of Severodonetsk city of Luhansk while using butterfly mines to hinder the movement of Russian forces and pro-Russian milit militants. A local militia members say that at present, 80% of Severodonetsk is controlled by Chechen special forces and Luhansk militia forces who are shrinking the encirclement of the key stronghold of, azot, of the azot chemical plant. Now, at the same time, Ukraine says the azot plant does not have an air raid shelter like the azot steel plant. Now, currently, about 300 civilians are trapped in the plant. Ukraine has asked Russia to open a humanitarian corridor and evacuate the trapped people in Lys to Lysyshansk. A battle around the plant has become complicated as Ukrainian forces are taking advantage of the lakes to the southeast of the plant to hold on, with high possibility of receiving replenishment, replenishments. Large-scale forest fire, probably caused by the exchange of artillery fire, has also made the situation precarious. In the meantime, Ukrainian sappers have removed a 500-kilogram unexploded bomb from the roof of an apartment building in the city of Kharkiv. A bomb which hit a residential building in the city's Saltivka district in March was deactivated the day after the attack, but the non-stop shelling of the area in the weeks that followed made it impossible to remove the bomb itself. A specialist team in the Ukrainian emergency ministries used a crane and a forklift to dislodge the bomb from the roof and remove it from the building. Multiple missile strikes also hit the Kharkiv Polytechnic Institute sports <laughs> complex, <laughs> with no casualties re re reported. Emergency services say the fire spread around 200 square meters. Sports equipment, mats, floor, and wall cladding were also on fire. There are no casualties reported either. A shelling was carried out on big objects such as sports halls, schools, kindergartens, assuming that Ukrainian armed forces are staying there. Kharkiv suffered heavy bombardment from the very start of uh, the Russian invasion, which left much of the city of 1.5 million people a wasteland of ruined buildings and debris. Speaking of which, an, a residential apartment block was damaged in the Russian back separatist region of Donetsk on Thursday. What officials say was shelling by the Ukrainian army. Local residents of the apartment building in Donetsk said they took shelter in a basement during the attack on Thursday morning, which reportedly also caused a fire to break out. Later, residents inspected the extent of the damage caused to their apartments. Ukraine routinely denies carrying out any attacks on the two regions that comp comprise the Donbass, the cell style Donetsk, and Luhansk People's Republics, where separatists seized large swaths of land in 2014. I want to bring in the VOA's Anna Chernikova. She joins us from Kiev. Anna, great to see you, and I see you're outside. So um, Kiev must be looking great today, right? Good evening. Yes, it's uh, a great weather and, uh, well, quite a great mood after yesterday's decision by the European countries. So, yeah, today it's, uh, well, quite, quite a nice day if we don't think about the war, of course. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's not difficult to think about the war. That's what everyone in Ukraine is thinking about right now. So let's talk about Severodonetsk for a minute. Uh, the Ukrainian troops have been given an order to leave, and they're already uh, leaving the city. What does this mean? Uh, yeah, so today in the morning, it was confirmation that actually Ukrainian forces started the withdrawal from Severodonetsk. Um, we actually, well, this is quite an expected decision, to be honest, because for the past couple of weeks, the situation was really dramatic and very, very difficult. And uh, there were talks that this might happen. So from the very beginning, Ukrainian um, officials, uh, military officials uh, were saying that it might happen that one day this would be the final decision. And 
as what as what was said today that um, it's for the moment uh, the task that Ukrainian soldiers uh, have accomplished is a pure heroism, and they managed to you know uh, to uh, keep uh, Russian forces uh, in this battle for quite a long time. It was not expected by Russian forces because they uh, well the plan was to you know capture Severodonetsk much faster. So for Ukraine it was a great battle, and uh, as we um, as what we hear from the military uh, is that uh, this is a strategic decision, and Ukrainian forces are moving to the uh, to another positions which are more prepared for defense and uh, which were have been preparing for all this time. Uh, so now the main task in this area would be to protect Lysychansk. And this is what we know for the moment. Uh, also, we know that still Ukrainian forces are re remaining in Severodonetsk. So it's not that everyone have already left. At least this is what we're hearing. So, of course, uh, we will get confirmation when it is done. But for the moment, we know that um, probably most of, of the forces have already moved, but some uh, still remain there. But uh, this procedure is is going to be completed soon. And, and, and if if uh, the Ukrainian uh, soldiers are leaving, it means the people also have to be on the move because there will be no protection for them in Severodonetsk. Uh, we also understand the Russian uh, forces are also targeting Lysychansk. So what's been happening in that city and who controls Severodonetsk now? Uh, well, for the moment, most of the of the city is definitely under Russian control and. Uh, even the territory where Ukrainian soldiers were, um, that Ukrainian soldiers were controlling and were located, uh, it's now basically, you know, in the process of withdrawing. So they're getting out from Ukrainian forces, I mean, getting out from this territory. So uh, for the moment, we cannot say that 100% uh, of the city is captured because it's still the withdrawal process. But apparently, uh, well, this is what's going to happen. In terms of the villains, well, unfortunately, a lot of people remain there. I mean, uh, in terms of, you know, amounts, um, it's, we talk about a couple of thousands probably, but again, uh, we will get a final confirmation when this would be, um, when we get it from the military officials, basically, because for the moment we don't know exact numbers. Uh, what we know is that people remain in the city and uh, Ukrainian forces want to organize, and they are asking Russian side to organize a humanitarian corridor for people to leave. Again, uh, as we already said last week, there were talks about this, but Russian forces didn't um, didn't agree to organize this corridor to Ukrainian controlled side. They only said that uh, civilians could leave to the uh, to the Russian controlled territory, which is, of course, not. Uh, not not a decision for these people. So these people want to remain in the Ukrainian controlled territory. And uh, now it would be another, I guess, another stage of talks because, well, of course, uh, unfortunately, people are trapped now and uh, they will probably have to wait for, you know, this military uh, finalization of the military process. And, um, and then we'll see if a humanitarian corridor, corridor would be created uh, or not. Indeed. Um, <clears throat> the humanitarian corridor is, is important, isn't it? Um, so that uh, unarmed civilians, of course, can leave. But we understand the Russians are targeting infrastructure in Severodonetsk. They're targeting schools, I mean, in the Donetsk region as well. Um, just reported now about the attacks there, and uh, they're targeting every building that's still standing at this moment. So, what is left in any of these cities? Yes, this is true, and unfortunately, this is a Russian tactics um, in every region of Ukraine, and we can clearly see it. So we can see that most of the civilian infrastructure was destroyed in the Kiev region when Russian forces were um, there. And uh, unfortunately, the same situation is in Izum, which is like a region. The city is uh, mostly destroyed. Uh, 
Mariupol, I'm just, I'm not even going to, you know, discuss that because Mariupol just completely destroyed. It's a huge city. And basically, this is similar what's happening now in Severodonetsk and now Lysychansk because Lysychansk is already under a very uh, severe artillery, uh, artillery attack and the bombardment so for the, for, for the, for the past weeks. And um, we can clearly see that, unfortunately, well, people are the target and the main target. So uh, Russian forces, uh, and, and actually this is what people who managed to escape this um, occupied territories are telling. Um, we had a chance to talk to people from different regions and they all are telling that the main, ta it seems that the main task is just to destroy the city, just to destroy normal life and life of people. And uh, well, unfortunately, Severodonetsk is is just another city that that will follow this destiny and already following because we know and we have confirmation that uh, a lot, massive amount of infrastructure of the civilian areas are destroyed. So this is just you know another war crime that you know we just put a put in the list. So sad indeed. Uh, beautiful cities coming under falling into a rubble uh, just because of this war. Thank you again, Anna, and do stay safe. Thank you. Well, as Anna mentioned, leaders of the European Union arrived for talks today. Uh, the bloc is used to suffer from the ongoing war in Ukraine. I'll talk about the candidacy status of Ukraine in just a bit. But just before that meeting, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz warned the, that Europe needs to ramp up efforts to cut its dependency from Russian fossil fuel imports. He said this was the reason why the bloc had not only imposed sanctions on Russian coal and oil at an early stage, but had as well worked on adjusting its interest infrastructure in a way that European countries can import gas from other countries too. Belgian Prime Minister Alexander de Croo added that EU countries need to start buying energy collectively and to implement price caps on gas to avert a major crisis in the coming winter. And the best thing that we can do as governments is support those portions of society that are suffering the most now because of a higher inflation. Today there will be discussion, is there something at the European level that could be done to bring down energy prices either through collective purchases or something like that, but this is probably a medium to longer term solution. So right now uh, we are all suffering uh, economically because of Russia's war, but we have to remember it's Russia's war which is causing the suffering. And about that uh, candidacy status for Ukraine, European leaders on Thursday granted the country the much coveted status to join the 27 nation union in a bold geopolitical move hailed by Ukraine and the EU itself as a historic decision. Although it could take Ukraine more than a decade to eventually join the European Union, the decision to officially accept it as a candidate is a symbolic step that signals the bloc's intention to reach deep into the former Soviet Union. Russia's invasion of Ukraine prompted key to formally apply for candidate status and the EU to approve it unusually quickly. Neighboring Moldova was also granted candidate status, while Georgia was told it would get the same once it has fulfilled some conditions. A bloc's leader stressed that these countries will have much homework to do, and the EU itself will need to change how it works to be able to cope with yet another extension of the club. We have decided to grant candidate status to Ukraine and Moldova, and we are ready to grant candidate status to Georgia once priorities will be addressed. This is a very defining moment and a very good day for Europe today. Um, I warmly congratulate President Zelensky, President Sandu, President Zurabishvili. All three countries are part of our European family. We've never let any doubt about that. And today's historic decision by leaders confirms that. Let me stress that I'm deeply convinced that our decision that we have taken today strengthened us all. It strengthens Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia in the face of Russian aggression. And it strengthens the European Union. 
Well, the general in the U.S. say they're working together to counter what they describe as Russia's cynical grains war. Speaking ahead of the G7 summit in Berlin this weekend, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken pointed out that the sides were aware of the deep concerns about food insecurity. The Global Network Against Food Crisis report states that the war in Ukraine poses serious risk to global food security, especially in countries here, facing existing uh, the, uh, food crises, including Afghanistan, security. Ethiopia, Haiti, before, Somalia, South uh, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. Russia and Ukraine account for nearly a third of global wheat and barley, and two-thirds of the world's export of sunflower oil used for, cook for cooking. Before Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24, 90% of the grains and sunflower oil were shipped out through Ukrainian ports on the Black Sea, a route that's now been disrupted. We hear. Well, more, the G7 summit leaders of the world's largest industrialized nations are set to gather on June 26th through the 27th to discuss, among other issues, the war in Ukraine, of course, and ways to stabilize energy markets in light of the weaning dependence on Russian gas. The event scheduled to begin on Sunday will kick off with a bilateral meeting between U.S. President Joe Biden and the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky is also expected to address the meeting remotely. South Africa, India, Senegal and Indonesia are also invited to attend the summit as guest countries. For more on what to expect from the summit, we have joining us the DW's uh, correspondent, Lars Halter. Lars, thank you for joining me on the program today. Uh, G7 leaders are meeting this weekend uh, in Germany, which is where you are, of course, currently holding, uh, which currently holds the presidency of the Group of uh, Seven. Who's expected to attend and what else can you tell us? Well, it will certainly be a very busy weekend in Germany and especially in the southern part of Germany near Munich where this G7 meeting will be held. The G7 group of course comprises other than host country Germany, the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, Japan, France and Italy. But other than these countries' leaders, uh, there are some special guests invited. Among them is uh, UN General Secretary Antonio Guterres. There's leaders there from the African Union. Um, and then uh, some of the major developing countries will be present as well, among them South Africa, India and Indonesia, as well as Argentina, because in uh, some of the most pressing issues, the G7 wants to make sure to, inclo uh, to include these very important partners, of course. Right. And, and what's on the agenda for the summit? Well, it will certainly be a very busy weekend in Germany and especially in the southern part of Germany near Munich where this G7 meeting will be held. The G7 group of course comprises other than host country Germany, the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, Japan, France and Italy. But other than these countries' leaders, uh, there are some special guests invited. Among them is uh, UN General Secretary Antonio Guterres. There's leaders there from the African Union. Um, and then uh, some of the major developing countries will be present as well, among them South Africa, India and Indonesia, as well as Argentina, because in uh, some of the most pressing issues, the G7 wants to make sure to, uh, to include these very important partners, of course. The main topics, is there mostly agreements within the group or are there any particularly tricky issues that need to be discussed? There's actually a lot of uh, tricky issues that needs, need to be discussed and mainly uh, is really the response to Russia. What is the further and most appropriate response to Russia in this ongoing war? Sanctions, of course, is the number one solution. Uh, there are already tough sanctions against Russia in place, but there should be harsher sanctions that will be dis discussed. 
The problem is, and this is where the developing nations are uh, coming into play, a lot of the major developing economies are dependent on Russia financially, economically, as we have also seen for supplies of wheat, of energy. And while some of the major G7 economies can take some pummeling economically because they have a lot of reserves, uh, they are rich societies, the developing nations mostly cannot uh, lose the dependency, they cannot afford to get on the wrong side of Moscow. So that's going to be a fine line that leaders have to talk present for those negotiations, by the way, is Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, who will be also taking part in the summit, of course, by a video link, as he, of course, remains in his country. But there definitely will be uh, a lot of discussion about how to respond to Russia and also at the same time how to further help Ukraine. Currently, there's been a lot of talk about a new Marshall Plan, of course, uh, modeled after and named after the original U.S.-led Marshall Plan that helped rebuild Europe after World War II. And uh, that could include payments by the G7 nations of more than $5 billion monthly to help bring Ukraine back once the war is over. Well, Lars, thank you for the updates. We know that uh, we can reach out to you uh, when the meeting starts. Thanks again. Welcome back. You're watching The World Today on Channel's television. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has pledged to keep going and do more to tackle a cost-of-living crisis after suffering bruising defeats in two by-elections. The loss of two parliamentary seats was a crushing blow to the governing Conservative Party that prompted the resignation of the party's chairman and intensified doubts about the future of Britain's Prime Minister. Following the losses in Tiverton and Honiton in southwest England, and Wakefield in the North, Conservative Party Chairman Oliver Dowden resigned in a carefully worded letter that hinted he believed Johnson should take responsibility for the election defeats. I want to say a, a big thank you to Oliver Dowden, who's, uh, who's just resigned. He's been an excellent uh, party chairman. He uh, was a very good culture secretary, did a lot of, uh, of good with broadband rollout, uh, set up the Office for Veterans Affairs. And uh, yes, it's absolutely true that uh, we've had some, some tough by-election results, and uh, they've been, I think, uh, a reflection of uh, a lot of things, but we've got to recognize that uh, voters are going through a tough time at the moment, and I think that as a, a government, uh, I've got to listen to what people are saying, and in particular to the difficulties people are facing over the cost of living, uh, which is, I think, for most people, the, the number one issue. And there, what we're doing is as much as we can to help people, £1,200 for the 8 million most vulnerable households, uh, help for everybody uh, with the cost of, of heating, trying to cut taxes uh, where we can. Uh, but what I can say to people is we will get through this, we will get through it well, uh, but clearly we've got to listen, from, uh, listen to these results. A Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting has officially opened in the Rwandan capital, Kigali. The host, President Paul Kagame, who takes over chairmanship of the 54-nation group that represents a third of the world's population, said it is values that define its membership. These include good governance, a rule of law, and protection of rights. Hosting the event, it brought his own government under sharp criticism over its human rights record. He said the country had come a long way since the genocide of 1994 in which more than 800,000 people were killed. Much of the Commonwealth brings together countries that were part of the British Empire, but has increasingly included others like Rwanda, Gabon, a former French colony, uh, is said to be admitted to the body during the meeting. We join together to pay tribute to Her Majesty the Queen, the head of the Commonwealth, and its most devoted champion. Over her 70 years of service, the Commonwealth has grown both in number and in the scope of its ambition.
Meanwhile, Prince Charles has told Commonwealth leaders he cannot describe the depths of his personal sorrow at the suffering caused by the slave trade. Speaking in Rwanda, he said the potential of the family of nations could only be realized by acknowledging the wrongs that had shaped our past. His words, Prince Charles, who is representing the Queen at the Commonwealth Heads of Government Meads and described how he was on a personal journey of discovery and was continuing to deepen my own understanding of slavery's enduring impact. Prince Charles added that it was up to states to decide if they remi remained monarchies or became republics in the future. He also met the Prime Minister after reports he'd criticised the UK's Rwanda asylum plan. Uh, these uh, countries, that's the 54 member countries of the Commonwealth, uh, are meeting uh, with the Queen as its head. But she, of course, is absent, being represented by Prince Charles. For while we strive together for peace, prosperity and democracy, I want to acknowledge that the roots of our contemporary association run deep into the most painful period of our history. I cannot describe the depths of my personal sorrow at the suffering of so many as I continue to deepen my own understanding of slavery's enduring impact. If we are to forge a common future that benefits all our citizens, we too must find ways, new ways, to acknowledge our past. Quite simply, this is a conversation whose time has come. To achieve this potential good, however, and to unlock the power of our common future, we must also acknowledge the wrongs which have shaped our past. Many of those wrongs belong to an earlier age with different and, in some ways, lesser values. By working together, we are building a new and enduring friendship. In Canada recently, my wife and I were deeply touched to meet many of those engaged in the ongoing process of reconciliation. Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples reflecting honestly and openly on one of the darkest aspects of history. The Commonwealth contains within it countries that have had constitutional relationships with my family, some that continue to do so, and increasingly those that have had none. I want to say clearly, as I have said before, that each member's constitutional arrangement as republic or monarchy is purely a matter for each member country to decide. Joining me now is Nigeria's former ambassador to Ethiopia and second vice president of the Association of Retired Career Ambassadors of Nigeria, ARCAN, Ambassador Luke Olu. Olusegun Akinsoya. Ambassador Akinsoya was also head of the planning committee for the 2003 Chogum, which held here in Nigeria. Ambassador, thank you for joining me on the program today. Thank you very much, uh, Marachi, for having me. And I'm sure you were listening in on uh, Prince Charles's comments, his speech at the opening ceremony of uh, the Chogum meeting in Rwanda. And he's talking about, you know, the conversations surrounding slave slavery, uh, the enduring, uh, slavery's enduring impact. And then he says, um, now is the time to acknowledge the past. Now is the time to have that conversation. Is it significant that he's saying this in Rwanda, where there's been much criticism, especially recently on the country's human rights, you know, and um, this immigration plan that the UK has with the country? Yes, uh, I, I think the, the the Chogum, the Rwanda, it's very significant in many respects. Uh, first, you know that um, Commonwealth is multilingual. It is multi-ethnic. And it's a political association of about 54 countries, of whom, most of whom are former British territories. Um, others have uh, joined, like uh, Mozambique, uh, Cameroon, and uh, Gabon, and now uh, Rwanda. Uh, the meeting in Rwanda, it's very important because of the past. 
uh, the genocide of 1994, and the, the hard, very sad period in history. Added to that is the border problems between the DRC and uh, the eastern part of the Congo DRC and, uh, and uh, Rwanda. But when you talk about modernity, modernization, uh, and uh, the important, uh, significant achievement that Rwanda has made in the last few years that is now a signature of all eyes. So the Commonwealth taking place in a country like that sends very strong signals of can do by many African countries. And uh, the, 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 the Prince Charles coming to deliver a very important subject about, about slavery uh, resonates uh, because, you know, it's one of the darkest parts of Africa and uh, it cannot be forgotten. But at the same time, we need to really, really start the conversation, not only in terms of uh, enlisting the forgiveness of those countries that were responsible for that slavery, but at the same time, it enables uh, the Commonwealth as the protector of democratic values and good governance uh, to, to send the right signals to many African countries. So the, 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 the 26th Chogong in Rwanda, it's a very important event indeed. Well, um, he, he's sort of like kick-starting this conversation surrounding slavery. And if I'm going by what you're saying, um, you know, the, the uh, Commonwealth leaders, of course, and I, and I like the way that he put it when he says, you know, the, what, they, what uh, the service that they had uh, committed to his own family, not to Britain. Um, you think that Britain should begin, you know, with uh, an apology, perhaps, you know, to some of these countries because um, they're very much involved in the, they were very much involved in the slave trade back then, and it's the reason uh, that that the, they came here. Um, shouldn't they start off this whole conversation, Prince Charles is talking about, um, with that? Well, I, I think uh, it's uh, it's a very important thing that uh, Prince Charles. Uh, reintroduces uh, this conversation because the issue of uh, slavery, uh, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and other related injustices have been the subject that has attracted um, a lot of uh, discourse in the, in, the, in the UN. I recall that when I was in, serving, in the service, I attended the popular Durban conference. Uh, that a lot of injustices have been done by colonialism and slavery. And it's time that um, those who committed those atrocities uh, must apologize and to say sorry for the atrocities they committed and also for what, uh, what was lost in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the slavery. And, 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 I, and I think uh, rejuvenating or reactivating this conversation is going to be very good for the promotion of international peace and security and also for development uh, because you know that uh, we are now faced with a lot of global challenges and uh, you know the the richer nations uh, have a responsibility uh, in terms of uh, sharing uh, the uh, the technology, the investments for, for the developing countries, uh, particularly in the Commonwealth, which consists of countries from Asia, Pacific, Caribbean, to benefit. Uh, so I, I think it's uh, the variety of the, of, of the multilingual membership uh, is it, very, very significant. And that now that this conversation has started, uh, it should uh, be brought to the front burner. Does the multilingual membership, um, does it bring the Commonwealth into modern day, um, the, the world that we live in today? Does it make it more relevant now than it was uh, when it first started? Yes, uh, you know that the Commonwealth, the old Commonwealth started with about four 
colonies, territories, um, New Zealand, Australia, Britain, and South Africa. And it has uh, progressively, progressively enlightened membership. And uh, you know, you have now even non English speaking territories uh, coming into the fold, uh, you know, for international cooperation and partnership. And, and, I, and I think that is good for the, for the, for the international uh, relation, the multifaceted nature of uh, the extensions, you know, in terms of investments, in terms of information sharing with the global challenges. And I think uh, it, it, it reflects the multi-ethnic, multilingual, and uh, multidimensional aspects of international relations. And I think uh, it, it, it reflects the modernity of, the, of, 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 of our times, uh, that the um, Commonwealth is now playing that role as the protector of democracy, human rights, good governance, and those democratic values that is very embedded in the British tradition that has now been you know, shared worldwide. And I think it, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's very good for the international practice. Also, you know that uh, the French, the French-speaking countries also had their lineage, like lineage to the Franco-African, but of course that seems to be, it seems to be losing steam. And uh, that, is, that explains why you have countries like Gabon, uh, countries like even Togo making some overtures, and uh, the Lusophone, Lusophone countries, uh, Mozambique, Angola, also being part of the Commonwealth. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's something that um, will help the international relations, international cooperation and partnership. Uh, Ambassador, very quickly, what role do you think Nigeria still plays in the Commonwealth? Well, Nigeria has very important role to play in the Commonwealth, a formidable member of the Commonwealth. And in spite of uh, some of its so downward trends at the period of the military, particularly during the Abacha regime, where Nigeria was out, I think was suspended out of the Commonwealth. But in spite of that, um, the, the Nigeria hosted uh, 2003, uh, one, what can be called one of the best conferences uh, you know, that this country has ever uh, organized, and it is not easy to organize Commonwealth, Commonwealth conferences because they had their standards. I recall as the chair of uh, the, I mean, sorry, as the head of the secretariat, we were working on tight blue book that lays out the conditions, the structures, you know, the retreats, the committee of the whole, and all the things that we have to do. And we pulled out a very, very successful Chugong, uh, 2003, with the queen, uh, uh, you know, in Abuja, and, uh, you know, with all, that, uh, all, the, all the structures were put in place. So, you know, the Nigeria has, has played a formidable role. One of the greatest values of demo democratic principles good governance that abound today as principles of the Commonwealth. Nigeria was one of the architects of the Harare Declaration. I, I, I happen to be part of that uh, meetings in Harare that laid out, laid out the principles for democracy, good governance, human rights. And I believe that um, this resonates in that system, even though we have had certain uh, fallbacks, you know, in terms of uh, pursuit of uh, democracy. But Nigeria, you see, remains, remains a very a democratic country, uh, in spite of all our, our past and the challenges that we have gone through. So Nigeria will continue to gain a lot. The Commonwealth, the, the various structures, the Commonwealth Fund for Technical Cooperation, CFTC, Commonwealth of Learning, uh, Commonwealth Business Council, and this is, you know, uh, the Commonwealth Youth Council. Um, we have a very strong delegation in Kigali 
uh, and uh, I, 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 we are likely to have the secretariat of the youth council. You know, so I, I think Nigeria will continue to play a very important role in the Commonwealth uh, as we look forward to uh, 2003 with the new government. We're looking forward to bringing about those democratic principles that Nigeria was known for oh. uh, post independence. So Nigeria will continue to lend. I mean, of course, there's the Commonwealth Games. Right. Um, Ambassador, also the monetary... Ambassador, I wish we had more time to talk about, you know, the um, benefits and the advantages of having Nigeria in the Commonwealth. Thank you again. Appreciate your analysis. Thank you for joining us this evening. It's my pleasure, Marathi. Thank you. And when the world today returns. We visit New York's first ever. Welcome back to the program. The UN's Human Rights Office has concluded that Israeli forces and not Palestinian militants shot dead a high profile Al Jazeera journalist. A spokeswoman says the findings were the result of independent monitoring of the incident on May 11th. The killing of Shireen Abu Akla, who was reporting on an Israeli operation in the occupied West Bank, caused widespread outrage. Palestinians have blamed Israel. Israel says blame cannot yet be determined. All the information we have gathered, including official documentation from the Israeli military and the Palestinian Attorney General, is consistent with the finding that the shots that killed Abu Akhle and injured her colleague came from Israeli security forces and not from indiscriminate firing by armed Palestinians, as was initially claimed by the Israeli authorities. We have found no information suggesting that there was activity by armed Palestinians in the immediate vicinity of the journalists. More than six weeks after the killing of journalist uh, Shirin Abu Akleh and the injury of her colleague Ali Samoudi in Jenin on the 11th of May 2022, it is deeply disturbing that Israeli authorities have not conducted a criminal investigation. We at the UN Human Rights Office have concluded our own independent monitoring into the incident. Meanwhile, millions of women in the United States will lose the legal right to abortion after the Supreme Court overturned a 50-year-old ruling that legalized it nationwide. A court struck down the landmark Roe v. Wade decision weeks after an unprecedented leaked document suggested it favored doing so. The judgment will transform abortion rights in America, with individual states now able to ban the procedure. Half of the U.S. states are expected to introduce new restrictions or bans. The team have already passed so-called trigger laws that will automatically outlaw abortion following the Supreme Court's ruling. A number of others are likely to pass new restrictions quickly. Also in the U.S., a bipartisan package of modest gun safety measures has passed the U.S. Senate. A landmark court ruling and Senate action on gun safety illustrate the deep divide over firearms in the United States. Weeks after mass shootings in Uvalde, Texas, and Buffalo, New York, killed more than 30 people, including 19 children. The Senate bill, approved in a 65 to 33 vote, is the first significant gun control legislation to pass in three decades in a country with the highest gun ownership per capita in the world and the highest number of mass shootings annually among wealthy nations. This is not a cure-all for all the ways gun violence affects our nation, but it is a long overdue step in the right direction. Passing this gun safety bill is truly significant, and it's going to save lives. And as a result, this bill also has the chance to prove to a weary American public that democracy is not so broken that it is unable to rise to the moment when the need for action, like right now, in the wake of Uvalde and Buffalo, is most acute. What are we doing? Why are we here? We're answering those questions today, not fully, but with enough force that anxious moms and dads and kids all across this nation can wake up tomorrow and be a little bit more confident that the adults who run this country actually care about their safety. Because you know what? People still believe in us. People still count on us. 
Those who say we need to infringe on the rights of law-abiding citizens under the Constitution in order to make good policy are offering a false choice. Passing good public policy and supporting the Constitution are not mutually exclusive. Staying with the gun laws, a pediatric trauma surgeon who treated four victims of the mass shooting in Uvalde, Texas, vividly remembers the worst part of that day. Dr. Lillian Liao, the pediatric trauma medical director of University Hospital in San Antonio, says her team treated four wounded victims, three children and one adult on May 24th. She waited for more until the awful realization dawned on her. Today marks one month since a teenage gunman suspected Enter, suspect entered Rob Elementary School and killed 19 children and two teachers. Our Washington correspondent Maria Bird joins us now. Maria, uh, while this is good news, the Senate passed in the gun control bill. A real work, of course, is with the House of Representatives, where both sides will debate it. How's that looking out? should be a shoe-in. Um, this should not be a major issue as much as it was for the Senate. Um, as we know, the Senate was 65 to 33 vote in favor, 15 Republicans, one on the Democratic side. And so I think that is really where Americans were a bit nervous about this bill. Um, it is hopeful. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is stating that she believes that this will pass and they will have it on the president's desk before the end of the day. And so uh, this bill is expected to be signed here very shortly. Um, and so if that is the case, if all speculations of the House will be able to get this uh, through the floor pretty quickly, uh, then we could definitely see this in place by early next week. Uh, now, the, the bigger piece here is really about, is this enough of a, a bill and are the ramifications going to be strong enough to see a reduction in what has become a spree of mass uh, gun violence across the country? Indeed, isn't that the question? And of course, what happens to the bigger reforms that have been pushed by President Joe Biden, such as the ban on assault weapons and increase in the, in, the, in, the, in the age limit at which guns can be purchased? Those are other real issues that this bill really doesn't address. Yes, the bill really looks at funding to be able to address mental health. Um, obviously, that was one of the big uh, pushes and ways in which I think it was able to come to a bipartisan agreement is that the acknowledgement that many individuals um, who have been uh, conducting these mass shootings have mental health illnesses. And so uh, wraparound services for mental health and being able to spread that throughout the states and the U.S. is what they're really looking at as a way to potentially curb uh, the violence. And obviously, additionally, being able to, to release juvenile uh, records, uh, criminal records. And I think that is something that will definitely have a marked change because uh, that's something that typically is not released. Juvenile criminal records are typically held and not released, especially when you're looking at uh, for someone being able to, to purchase a gun. The red flag laws as well will be helpful. Uh, those red flag laws will be able to identify individuals um, who have had previous incidences with uh, gun violence, and they will obviously be flagged in that area and potentially not able to buy it gun. And then the boyfriend loophole, which is individuals who have had domestic violence uh, issues in the past and have been convicted of domestic violence not being able to purchase a gun. So those are all issues. The, the question, though, here is when you talk about that 18 to 21, are we going to be able to move forward with potentially uh, definitely eliminating the 18 year old from being able to purchase a gun and really moving it toward the age of 21, which I think is what is going to be in the next steps as we talk about the future of additional gun control policies. Thanks again, Maria, for joining us. To some lighter news now as we end the program. Recovering from COVID-19 pandemic, people are coming back to New York City and so are their dogs. Black Lab Cafe has just opened on the Upper West Side, if you're around the area, with menus of treats for both humans and their four-legged companions. It purports to be the first Java joint of the canine kind. Owners and dogs enter through a vestibule with two sets of doors, a safety measure in case any pups make a run for it. <laughs> There's then a seating area for creatures of all kinds. It connects a second section via another glass vestibule where humans can order food and coffee to bring back to the table area to join with their patiently awaiting pup. A per health department rules, dogs are not allowed in the food ordering area, but owners can see their pets through a glass partition 
while they wait for their food. So we basically, uh, we would hang out with Daisy and Lola all the time up here and realize that there was no place to take them. And uh, it actually became kind of burdensome to want to grab a coffee or just have any kind of normal food and, and hang out with them. So we just decided to make it ourselves. Yeah, we're not fans of tying up your dog outside, especially in a place like New York City. So we thought the you know, neighborhood really needed a place where you could come be with your dog and enjoy food and treats both for yourself and for your dog. You know, I think as being a dog cafe, we're more specifically catering to the dog. So we have a dog menu. So there's more uh, to offer and more welcoming towards dogs rather than just being dog friendly, which would imply that uh, you can bring your dog there, but you can't really order anything for your dog. So I know that wasn't as simple as you probably would like it to be, but that, that's, uh, that's basically the main. Also, that there are a lot of places that are dog friendly, but they're dog friendly in the sense that you can bring your dog, but your dog still must be on leash. Here, your dog can be off leash playing with other dogs. I guess a dog's going to be any happier. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani. See you later.